Hey everybody, and welcome to week 11 of the Bring Back the Salmon Classroom Hatchery program. This week we're gonna be hearing from three conservation authorities about some ways that we can help to protect our watersheds. A watershed describes an area of land where streams and river systems drain to the same water body. For example, I have mentioned throughout this program the Lake Ontario watershed. This is the area of land around Lake Ontario that contains the rivers and streams that drain into Lake Ontario. The scale of a watershed can also refer to a smaller lake, a series of lakes, or a river. Conservation authorities are important agencies that help to manage the quality and quantity of water in Ontario. There are 36 conservation authorities in Ontario and their boundaries are defined by watersheds. 95% of the people that live in Ontario live in a watershed managed by a conservation authority. Conservation authorities help to protect and to improve the health of our land and water for the whole community, human and non-human. They protect our drinking water, undertake environmental stewardship, which is caretaking, monitor water quality and quantity, and enforce laws to protect lives and properties from floods, erosion, drought, and pollution. And they help connect people to the natural environment through education and recreation opportunities. For the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, we partner directly with Conservation Halton, Credit Valley Conservation, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, and Ganaraska Conservation for monitoring of fish communities and Atlantic salmon survival, tree planting, and garbage cleanups. I would like to give a huge shout out of thanks to not only the conservation authorities that work directly with our program, but also to all of the dedicated, passionate, and knowledgeable staff of all the conservation authorities who help to protect and enhance the health of watersheds in Ontario. Okay, we're gonna start with our warmer tank. Filters running. Aerators pumping out bubbles. Temperature is sitting right at seven. And there are more fish swimming around in the tank now. They're getting coming out of the gravel. Their yolk sacs are almost used up. So we're gonna be starting to feed these fish very soon. A couple things we have to do to prepare for that is we, uh, we're gonna be raising the temperature of the tank. We're sitting at seven now, so we'll go up just a touch from between eight to 10 to help stimulate some feeding, as well as we're gonna give them more light. So in the natural environment, at this stage of the fish's development, is gonna be a time when the ice has come off this cold water streams, so they're getting exposed to more light, and so we're gonna mimic that those conditions. Okay, and for this tank, filter's running great. Bubbles coming up from the aerator. And our little Elvin. Moving around right now because of the light hitting them. But we don't need to rush to get them out of this incubating tray. They're perfectly safe in there. If we let them out of the tray, they're just gonna be hiding down into the rocks. 
So I'm going to leave them in here for another week before we, uh, before we release them. Right. Both tanks are good again. So now we're going to hear from our Conservation Authority friends and then uh, another fishy facts from Johnny. Hello, my name is Kathy Grant and I'm one of the educators with Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority and I'm going to be presenting to you the Stream of Dreams. The Stream of Dreams program is a mix of environmental education, learning about water and how to protect it, and community art. The final part of the program is to create a Stream of Dreams mural for the community, reminding everyone that all drains lead to fish habitat. The Stream of Dreams story begins way over on the west coast of Canada in Burnaby, British Columbia. In 1998, a woman named Louise Tobin and her daughter Chanel were walking down to their local creek. Normally, they would hear the wonderful sounds of birds singing and animals happily enjoying the fresh water. However, on this day, the creek was silent. There were no signs of birds, no singing, or animals working. They looked at the creek and to their horror realized that the water had turned white. They took a closer look and saw all of the fish that were once swimming in the creek now floating at the top of the water. They wanted to find out how this had happened to their beautiful creek, but didn't know where to go. That's when they met Joan Carn from the local Streamkeepers Association, a group of scientists who explained that someone had put a toxic material into a storm drain, which contaminated the creek, killing everything in the water, including 5,000 fish. Louise and Chanel were horrified and wanted to do something, but didn't know what to do. One day, Chanel saw a mural with beautiful wooden butterflies and flowers painted up on a fence. She spoke to her mom about creating wooden fish to put on a fence, which would honor the fish that had died in this horrible spill. Louise thought this was a great idea, and she approached a local high school to ask for their help with the first ever Stream of Dreams mural. Together, they cut and painted over 2,000 wooden fish. Everyone loved the mural, but Louise realized that people didn't know why the fish were up on the fence. So she got back together with Joan from the Stream Keepers and came up with an education program. They started going into elementary schools to tell the story of the Burn Creek and talk about how we can protect it. The program grew from there, spreading across the country with Conservation Halton being the first group to bring the program to Ontario. Currently, over 100,000 students have participated in the program across the country and are working to protect our water. Now, let's get to the science behind the program. This is a picture of the water cycle. Is there any water being created during this cycle? Any new water? No, there's not. And why is that important to understand? It's important because if we pollute or contaminate the water, we just can't go out and create more fresh water. We must use what is already there. The water cycle connects us to our neighbors. We know that with the water cycle, water moves around through evaporation, transpiration, and precipitation. But it also goes through the watershed. A watershed shows us how water is connected to everything in the environment. As mentioned by my colleagues, there are 36 conservation authorities across Ontario. Pictured here is the Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority's watershed. Our watershed is located on the traditional territory of the Williams Treaty's First Nations, the Chippewas of Beausoleil and Georgina Island and Rama, as well as the Mississaugas of Alderville, Curve Lake, Hiawatha and Scugog Island. Our vision is healthy watersheds for today and tomorrow. Our mission is to advance watershed health through engagement, science and conservation. Remember, a watershed is the area of land drained by water. 
Central Lake Ontario Conservation's jurisdiction includes the watershed boundaries of 22 creeks that drain from the Oak Ridges Moraine in the north to Lake Ontario. It includes four major watersheds and 18 smaller ones as shown on the map. We drain 639 square kilometers. Our watershed stretches from the municipal boundaries of Ajax Pickering in the west to Clarington in the east, north from the Oak Ridges Moraine to Lake Ontario in the south. And like TRCA, Toronto Region Conservation, all of our creeks drain into Lake Ontario. So from this slide, you can see to the north is Scugog, and at the very top of where Scugog and Oshawa boundaries meet, that is the Oak Ridges Moraine. And the Oak Ridges Moraine stretches 360 kilometers east to west. And it was created by glaciers over 10,000 years ago. Any of the precipitation that falls to the south of the Oak Ridges Moraine ends up into Lake Ontario. And to the north, it goes into Lake Scugog, eventually Lake Simcoe. And all of our creeks and our lakes drain into eventually the Atlantic Ocean. This is another map of our Conservation Authority. And this one just shows the location of our properties, which are known as conservation areas. So we have conservation areas. Our more popular ones would be Lynn Shores Conservation Area in Whitby and Heaver Down Conservation Area in Whitby. Uh, and a Skellin Conservation Area is a popular one. Long Sioux and Purple Woods, which is where we make maple syrup. One of the most important uses of fresh water is for our drinking water, something everyone needs. There are two main sources of drinking water depending on where you live. You either get it from Lake Ontario or from groundwater. From the lake, it is treated before it gets into your home. It will come from the lake to a treatment plant, to a storage facility, and like I said, back into your home. Another way to get water is from groundwater or wells which are generally more in the rural areas. So the water is coming directly out of the ground and into your home. Once the water comes to our homes, there are a number of different ways we can use it. Some of the examples are, of course, flushing the toilet, brushing our teeth, showering, cooking, watering our garden, washing our clothes, our cars, etc. Once this water has been used, it's now called wastewater. The wastewater from inside our homes goes down the drains to a water treatment plant and then back out into the lake, unless you're living in the rural areas where it's going to go from your home into a septic tank. This is important to know because sometimes we put things down the drain like chemicals and medication that make its way through the treatment systems and back into the creeks and lakes. The other source of wastewater is from outside our homes and it, it flows into something called a storm drain. These storm drains you will see on the sides of the streets. These storm drains are usually connected to the stormwater ponds or in older communities they go out to the nearest creek or to Lake Ontario. The storm drains and stormwater retention ponds help to prevent flooding. Water that goes into a storm drain, like we said, goes directly out into the stormwater ponds or into um, Lake Ontario or ne nearby creeks, depending on where you live. This water is not treated. Here are some examples of ways pollutants can get into our waterways. It can be from fertilizing our lawns, farm fields. It could be uh, cars that are improperly maintained, so maybe leaking oil or other fluids. And then there's also general runoff from rain. So if it's raining or snow melting, anything that's on the ground that is small enough to fit into the grates, 
things like cigarette butts, maybe some dog waste, um, general garbage is going to find its way again into those storm drains and out into our lakes. And then sometimes there are still people who are dumping waste down the storm drains, thinking that this water is treated, but it's not. It's going directly out into our creeks. So why do we want to protect our water? It's not just for us, not just for human consumption. It's also for all the plants and animals that live in our areas. On behalf of Central Lake Ontario Conservation, thank you for your participation in this program. So welcome to Bring Back the Salmon Program Watershed Management Session. Today we are going to talk about where does the rain go? So when it rains, approximately half of the water soaks into the ground, except in urban areas where there are more hard paved surfaces and less natural ground to absorb it. In these areas, the water becomes stormwater runoff and collects in the storm sewers and waterways. As stormwater runs off, makes its journey, it picks up litter, road salt, salts, car fluid, and other pollutants. During these intense rain events, it can also cause flooding erosion in both natural and human-built environments. So this presentation is a joint effort between myself, Mary Gowan with Toronto Region Conservation Authority, Lindsay Champagne with Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority, and Kathy Grant with Central Lake Ontario Conservation Authority. First, I'll be talking about what a watershed is and what a healthy watershed is and what type of animal, birds, fish, and reptiles, and vertebrates you would find there. Then Lindsay will take us on a journey through the different water cycles using her watershed display. And finally, Kathy will discuss different types of stormwater pollutants and how you can take action to help. So as I mentioned, I'm with Toronto Region Conservation Authority, and I work in our education and training department as a community learning coordinator. My main role is to organize and deliver community programs to educate people about the environment and provide them hands-on events, such as tree planting, litter cleanups, and much more. This past year, we've also adapted our programs into virtual spaces and to keep the learning going and to help people discover the outdoors and in their neighborhood. So who is the TRCA? So with more than 60 years of experience, TRCA is one of 36 conservation authorities in Ontario, working with different municipalities and other partners to look after the watershed of the Toronto region and its Lake Ontario waterfront. We help people understand, enjoy, and look after the natural environment. So what we do, so we take care of nine watersheds and the Lake Ontario shoreline in partnership with municipalities, the province, and other stakeholders in the community. We work to preserve and protect the lands, improve wildlife and plant habitat, and encourage people of all ages to get out and enjoy nature for optimal health and well-being. We also monitor and report on the health of the, on, the, on Toronto's environment, and provide input and expertise on watershed management, resource conservation, natural heritage, and cultural heritage. We run quite a few programs that teach a greater appreciation of the environment and ways to adapt, adopt sustainable technologies. We also help to reduce human impact on natural resources while acqu acquiring, protecting, and restoring conservation lands to further watershed and resource management. So I did mention that we take care of nine watersheds um, throughout uh, the Toronto and region. So what is a watershed? So a watershed is the area of land that catches rain and snow and drains or seeps into a marsh, stream, river, lake, or into the groundwater. Watershed are collectors, filters, conveyors, and storage compartments for our fresh water supply. <clears throat> so as you can see, The TRCA jurisdiction covers the nine watersheds from Etobicoke Creek in the west um, and then all the way over to 
Duffins Creek and uh, Coretta Creek in the east. So maybe you can have a look at the map here and uh, find your city or town that you live in and figure out which watershed uh, you are in because everyone is in a watershed. As I mentioned, Lindsay and Kathy will also be talking about their areas, so you might be a bit further afield than the Toronto region, and, uh, and you'll be able to find your watershed um, on their maps as well. So what makes a healthy watershed? So what would you expect to find in a healthy system? So a lot of people think of clean water, um, you don't want to confuse that with clear water, uh, and this may not be necessarily clean sometimes, um, but uh, there's also, you can see in this picture, rocks, um, trees around it, um, and animals. We've got all kinds of different animals, um, you know, different amphibians, reptiles, and different things that live in a healthy water system. So a healthy water system conveys water and promotes stream flow, supports sustainable rivers, streams, lakes, and groundwater sources, and provides habitat for wildlife and plants. So all of these, the wildlife and plants, could be considered indicator species. So when you think of a healthy watershed, there's always animals, plants, and fish, and other species that live in and around the water. So to be considered a healthy system, there's always species that live and thrive there, which are indicators of the environmental conditions. And these indicators species serve as a measure of the ideal environmental conditions that exist in a given location. So the next few slides are going to look at um, some type of animals that are present in a watershed and how they can be great indicator species for a healthy watershed. So first up, we've got the mammals. So as you can see, we've got a couple of examples here, the otter, the raccoon, the beaver, and the muskrat. So they require clean water to drink, but also they live in or near the water. And then many fish call the watershed of Southern Ontario home. So if there's some anglers in the audience, um, maybe you've identified a couple of these fish. So one of the major threats to fish is thermal pollution. So most of the pictured fish above are cold water adapted. Um, as rainwater falls on our cities, it absorbs heat from the roads and rooftops that cover our urban areas. And this runoff can be several degrees warmer than normal seasonal water temperatures. And when the runoff flows into our local streams and rivers, it's altered the preferred habitats of these animals and may lead to, to stress. So we've got here the largemouth bass, the rainbow trout, and the Chinook salmon. Then amphibians are very sensitive to water pollution due to their habitual aquatic lifestyle and semi-permeable skin. So most of the amphibians can exchange gases through their skin and likewise can easily absorb contaminants from the water. And for this reason, they're often described as a good indicator species, meaning that their status in the ecosystem can be a good indicator of the health of that ecosystem. So we've got the American bullfrog, the Eastern newt, and the blue spotted salamander. And because reptiles are exothermic, so they're cold blooded, we have a few, rep we only have a few reptile species in Canada, um, then some warmer countries to the south. So we boast about a dozen species of turtles and snakes, but only have one species of lizard. So the, the five line skate you can see here. Um, we've also got uh, the snapping turtle, the northern water snake, and the spotted turtle. So birds are one of the most visible types of wildlife that uh, we have here in Ontario, and there's a lot of them. 
So you know, did you know that there are more species of bird in the world, um, about 10,000, than there are any other vertebrates or backboned animals? So to compare, there's um, mammals include only about 57, uh, yes, 5,700 species, including the Homo sapiens, um, so the, the uh, humans. So invertebrates are very important to the health of the aquatic ecosystem. They are at the base of the food chain, and without them, many of the animals that we've seen in the previous slide wouldn't exist. So a lot of these invertebrates are also indicator species. So this is just a couple examples, the green garnered dragonfly, the clear water crayfish, and the water boatman. And the plants form the other major base of the food chain. Some plants like phytoplankton are so small that we can't even see them. So there are a lot of plants that have adapted to live really close or even in the water. And willows um, are water loving trees. So you can see the black willow here. And then the northern blue flags are iris um, that love the moist soil on the river bank. Well, both cattails and pond lilies live right in the water. So these plants not only provide food and habitat for many animals, but they also help to filter out the contaminants in the water um, with their extensive fibrous root system. So we use water every day. All of us live in the watershed and rely on it for many reasons. So drinking water, recreation, swimming, and washing your hands. <clears throat> so how do humans use their water? And there are various other ways that we do use water. So just a quick question um, to get you thinking about how you do use water. So how many times have you turned on the tap today? Um, zero, seven, 15, more than 20. So washing your hands or brushing your teeth, kind of getting a glass of water or watering your plants. Um, even events, uh, you know, that you don't think about doing, like your dishwasher or washing machine, um, having a shower, those are all ways that you use water. So to think about it, to think about your water usage and how you contribute to the watershed, um, you know, you want to help to do your part to conserve and reduce stormwater pollution. So Toronto Region Conservation Authority does have a program called Ranger Runoff a Stormwater Story. It's a brand new program that we offer to schools and community groups, and it's designed to help the class or group learn about the impacts of stormwater in a changing climate and discover how you can take action um, to protect drinking water, wildlife, and more. We also have some worksheets that are up online right now. Um, so this kind of relates to uh, our stormwater story um, program. Uh, this is one activity that's on there, the stormwater scavenger hunt. So you can go out and find different um, things that might affect the stormwater or not, um, and how they are positive or negative effects. Then we also have educator resources. Um, so you can go to uh, the, the Nature eLearning um, webpage on our trca.ca site um, and get the uh, worksheets. And we also have Facebook Live videos. Um, we also can uh, access um, the presentation for the Rain to Runoff and resources um, just by requesting um, access to the page or look at our different programs that we have. And recently, we've um, just finished kind of action projects. Um, so you can kind of look at different ways that you can engage your students um, through different projects at school. Um, so there's a school campaign or stream study, a litter cleanup or waste audit, um, and then discovering your downspouts and uh, rainwater harvesting. So thank you very much. Um, and this is the, the website that I was talking about, or you can get the uh, um, in touch with us on social media. Those are all of our uh, our handles there. So now I'm going to pass it along to Lindsay um, with Kanaraska Region Conservation Authority to discuss the water cycle and show us her water display. Hi, 
My name is Lindsay Champagne, and I'm the watershed biologist for the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority. As Mary has mentioned, a watershed is an area where surface water all drains to the same place, like a creek, river, lake, or ocean. These watersheds can be large, like the ocean, or small, like a small creek in your backyard. If you look at the map of our conservation areas, they're broken up into watersheds, and you can see that from Toronto to Coburg, there's many watersheds. Because the water in a watershed all goes to the same place, it all has the same fate and is very sensitive to pollution and land use. We're going to take the information that Kathy and Mary has given us about watersheds, water cycles, and storm drains and put it into a demonstration. So let's go see. Before we get to our demonstration, we're going to discuss how this is a watershed. It's difficult to see, but that big splotch right there is a mountain. And that means that it has higher elevation than the lake, which is way down there. Even this farm right here is higher in elevation, which means that any water that is there will drain down into the lake. You can also see that there are two creeks. You have the creek running here and the creek running there. Therefore, all of the water is draining to the same area and is expressing a drainage area, which would be a watershed. So let's get to how a watershed can be impacted by pollutants. All right, so first we're going to talk about point source pollutions. So point source pollutions are when there is one single area that contributes to pollution. An example of that would be this factory. So this factory, you can see, has an outlet that goes right to a water course. And this factory is non-compliant, means it's not following the rules, and it has pollution going right out. So if we have a giant rain event and that excess pollution goes into the water course, you can see, look at all that yellow stuff coming out of that pipe and going right into the creek. And that creek, just like Mary had told us, goes right to the Lake Ontario because that's in its watershed. Another example of a port point source pollution is where your poop goes. So, uh, so uh, sewage treatment plant. So you can see here, you have your little bays where all of the pollution sits and it settles out. So this right here is a controlled setting, but much like the factory, if there is a big storm event and the, these tanks overflow, then let's see what happens. See? All of that pollution goes out of those bays and into the adjacent creek that's here. So those are point source pollutions because they're going directly from one area into the watershed. So Kathy talked to you a lot about storm drains and how they are a pipe that is from a subdivision, so we'll say this one, that goes directly to the nearest water course. So although that water is hidden, it's still going right into the water course. So in this subdivision here, we have lots of pollution. So we'll, we're going to use styrofoam as our, our example. And then we also have this construction zone because somebody wants to build a house. So there's lots of dirt here. And look at there's a stockpile with nothing preventing it from going right down. Then you have some pesticides. And who knows, this car could have had an oil leak. And then right next door, we have our golf course and our nice little mountain here with no trees. So we'll see what happens when it rains and how it impacts the storm drain. Are you ready? Woo. Did you see that pollution fly? So you can see that the dirt is starting to fall away out of that area and some of the herbicides and fertilizers are washing away and the dirt on the mountain is washing away. And now let's see what would happen if it's a big rainstorm, everyone. Big rainstorm. Woo! That's a lot of rain. 
See all that pollution going right into Lake Ontario? And that all came from way up in the watershed up here and went right down there. Big mess. We'll see how we can fix that later. So now we're going to go into a more rural setting. So we have a farm here and on this farm we have some fields here that were being cleared and we have some cows that have no fencing and lots of poop right by that water. And in most fields a lot of people will add some added nutrients into their field to help their plants grow. So if there's a big rain event, there's nothing to stop this dirt from going right into the lake. It doesn't even have to go to a creek. So let's see what will happen if it rains on this farm. Ooh. Look at that. It's going pretty fast. And then how about what happens to the poo? Not much is happening to this poo, but it would also be washed away and it would go right into the lake. So now look at our Lake Ontario. Look at all of this dirt. We had this is the stuff from the factory. There's some plastic that came all the way from the subdivision over here and there's some herbicides and everything in here and that all came from higher up in the watershed and all washed down. So next we're going to see how we can mitigate which means prevent or fix this from happening to our lakes. So before we get into um, how to prevent the pollution and the sediment from getting into the water course, why are they bad? Well all of these invisible uh, pollutants on the landscape have some impact to the fish, wildlife, and even the water that we drink. For example, since you're in the Bring Back the Salmon pro program, you know that fish, especially salmon, live here, but they also come up the creeks to spawn where they will have their eggs. And all of that is extremely important for their well-being. Because if there's too much sand or dirt in the water, that can clog up their gills. If there's too much nutrients, that can also be harmful. So we just have to make sure that all of these mitigations are to not only help just fish, other wildlife, but also us so that we can swim in a clean lake and drink clean water. So now let's get to the mitigations. We're going to start in the subdivision area where we had our golf course and our hill. So let's start with this construction zone. So now in this construction zone we've put in a grass buffer. So this here is a buffer strip and the buffer strip is an area of vegetated or grass that prevents this dirt here from just washing away. We also have what's called a silt fence, which is going to be this yellow foam here. A silt fence will protect this pile, the stockpile, from just washing away during any events. Then, in our hill and our golf course, we put in some grass here where there wasn't grass before. We put in some nice big trees because the trees have roots and those roots not only stabilize or hold all of this dirt on the mountain, but it will also absorb all of the water during the rain. So that it'll hold in all of those, all of the dirt that's washing away. Also, the fertilizer that's here, you can kind of see on my finger, the green, the fertilizer that's invisible when it's on the grass will also be soaked up by these trees because they need all the nutrients that they can get to grow big and strong. So now, just like we did before, let's see what happens when it rains. So we'll start with the construction site. A lot less than last time. Even if we make it a storm, look at that, it's still stopped by that grass. And even look at the stockpile. That silk fence is doing a good job. It's holding all of that back and preventing it from going right into the streets. Now, if we do the streets, the streets have fertilizers because dads love green grass. 
and the pollutants, and it's going to get caught up on this vegetation strip here, but we still have to remember, it'll still go in that storm drain. So we have to remember to pick up all of our pollutions as much as possible. Now, the golf course. Let's see what happens now that we've planted all of the trees on the mountain and the golf course. Ooh, that's a nice one right there. Look at that tree is soaking up all of the rainwater and all of the fertilizer so that it's stopped right at the source. Even this little buffer, look. The grass is stopping all of that dirt from going right into the water. So much better. So if we had planted trees here instead of just this grass, we'll see what happens to all of this water that's there. See, it's just soaked up by all the roots. All the roots are soaking up that water. And if we plant more trees, more water is sucked up and more trees. Now we have a bigger buffer with more vegetation that will suck all of that water up and prevent as much sediment from entering the water as much as possible. If we skip to Lake Ontario here, we can see that there's a lot less pollution than there was before. We only have a little bit of sedimentation, which is probably from before we had our trees planted, but there's no herbicides, there's no green stuff, there's no yellow stuff, everything is all nice and clean in there. Now it's time to put it all together. Now that we know what a watershed is and what storm drains are, and from our demonstration, we learned how storm drains impact the watershed, it's time to think about how it relates to bring back the salmon program. Well, we know that fish live in the water and therefore they live within a watershed. We also know that whatever goes down a storm drain, including pollutants, directly impacts the water course, therefore impacting the fish. This is extremely important because these invisible pollutants such as excess nutrients and soil and just garbage can directly negatively impact the fish that live there and can even kill them. This is especially important for the Atlantic salmon because they already have few numbers and we're trying to bring them back. So think of other ways that you can help to reduce the amount of pollutants that are entering into the water course. Today, your mission is to think of five ways that you can reduce the amount of pollution that enters into your water course. And start now. Welcome to another segment of Fishy Facts. As always, I'm Johnny Nene. This week, we're gonna talk about a really cool fish the flying fish. Flying fish are found in temperate and tropical marine climates across the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. They typically grow between 17 and 30 centimeters, but can also reach up to 45 centimeters in length. Flying fish feed on plankton, although they sometimes consume small crustaceans. Flying fish do not fly but rather glide. Their streamlined bodies help them break the water's surface at speeds up to 56 kilometers per hour, and their large wing-like pectoral fins help them glide distances up to 200 meters. That's slightly longer than two football fields. Some species of flying fish also have large wing-like pelvic fins and are known as four-winged flying fish. Flying fish have uneven tails with a lower lobe that is longer than the upper lobe and they flap their tail along the water's surface to maintain or extend their glide. By using this method, flying fish have been recorded using consecutive glides spanning distances up to 400 meters. Flying fish will glide to avoid aquatic predators such as tuna, marlin, dorado, or other large fish species. But they must be careful. Too much lift and they become easy pickings for hungry seabirds. Flying fish are attracted to light and they are known to leap into well-lit boats. 
commercial fishermen use this to their advantage when pursuing flying fish. Along with their flesh, flying fish roe, or eggs, are a popular food item in many countries. Flying fish roe is especially popular in various sushi dishes and is called tobiko, which is Japanese for flying fish roe. Well, thanks for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the flying fish and be sure to check out next week's segment. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Kathy, Mary, Lindsay, and Johnny for those presentations. Conservation authorities also manage conservation areas where you can have direct contact with nature through recreational activities such as hiking, biking, paddling, and skiing. Some conservation areas also host workshops, courses, events, festivals, and programs that can help you learn more about nature and have some healthy fun outdoors. Have a look at the website for Conservation Ontario for a full list of conservation areas for you, your friends, and your family to enjoy. Next week, we'll be hearing from the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program title sponsor, Ontario Power Generation, on the work that they do to power Ontario and some of the great environmental programs that they undertake and make possible.